And welcome to Writer of the Week. Today we're here with Dr. Anika Rana, author of Wild Boar in the Cane Field. Welcome, Anika. How are you? I'm doing really well, thank you. It's a beautiful California day today. Wonderful. So can you tell us about your background and how this book came to life? So um, it starts when I was eight and my parents decided to move to um, the family farm in Pakistan. We had been living in, in, in England for uh, two years. And um, I was now in a situation, in an environment which was totally new to me, um, in the sense that I had never been surrounded by so many fields and animals and people who had different priorities in life and different ways of living. And so that experience was where this whole story started. But the story itself took many years to come to where it's at today. I felt I wanted to bring to life those memories through an imaginary world that I have created in this book. Uh, but with a lot of elements of the life that was lived back then, um, and so my goal was to create a space which is not any particular place and not any particular time, but definitely has all the elements of the human spirit of the time and the, uh, that, that I experienced uh, as a child. Um, the story is particularly about a young girl growing up in this environment, in, the, in a village, in Punjab, and I say Punjab because whether it's India, Pakistan, or even potentially Bangladesh or any South Asian country um, where there is a kind of a, a feudal element um, or a, a farm farming background, there are a lot of similarities. So what made you decide on the unusual, very evocative title, Wild Boar in the Cane Field? So the title comes literally from an expression that is used uh, on farms in Pakistan and in the Punjab um, in relation to the real threat of wild boar, uh, particularly in cane fields. And it's a Punjabi expression um, which refers to um, the dangers around, but particularly those of the wild boar. And it had, that expression, like many of the expressions that I've included in the book, stuck with me for so long, even though I had left the place you know, for quite a few years. Um, I decided that that would be a title I would use because there was on, on the farm, which you would think is, is a, you know, a peaceful place, there was always this threat of the weather or of the animals, or of something, um, some calamity happening, which would ruin the lives of the people who were living on the farm. So whether it was a thunderstorm that would ruin the crop, or whether it was a wild boar which could potentially come and attack folk, there was this all, always this ominous feeling of something could potentially go wrong. Um, but the reality was that people responded to those situations and were able to overcome those situations. And I actually never saw a wild boar attack. So one of my fondest memories of growing up in Pakistan is um, on the summer night, this was before air conditioning, um, the extended family, and that meant uncles, aunts, grandparents, cousins, siblings, Everyone would bring their charpai, which is a, a cotton cot. Um, you'd bring it outside and you would have a row of people sleeping outdoors. And you'd have a pedestal fan on each side to blow away the mosquitoes. Um, and that was the time for storytelling. So I have a favorite aunt who would always make sure that before we went to sleep, she would tell us stories. But at the same time as you'd have this really nice setup with uh, about 25 to 30 people sleeping outdoors, there was always this constant fear of be careful during the, you know, the sugar cane season, there might be wild boar that would come close to where our, our cots had been laid. And so it was a combination of a time of connecting um, but with always a little excitement around what would we do if, if a wild boar came up 
it never happened but there was still this what, what was the 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 culture behind sleeping outside like that what was that just uh, it was just so, so hot it was just so hot and there was um no air conditioning at the time we used to have what we call desert coolers but they wouldn't work during the rainy season um just because it was too humid and then of course and the memory also ended with the morning where it would be an, a burst of sunrise and i have i've tried to depict some of those scenes not necessarily the sleeping outside but some of those scenes and those those feelings of the intense heat and waking up in the morning and either to the sound of the call for the prayer or to the the extreme heat of the sun rising and then looking for a place to go a cool place to go and sleep because now it's early morning but it's the the heat has already you know what sort of temperatures um, are there temperatures were pretty high um 104 105 it goes even higher than that um and so you're pretty much you, you cannot really do much during the day and so your days start extremely early and end mid morning and then you have long afternoons and in fact one of the scenes in my book talks about these two young girls who who choose not to take the siesta um and that was similar to our childhood where all the adults would fall asleep and they would want the children also to take a long nap and we always resisted that because that was the time when there was no adult supervision and so two young girls the two young characters tara and maria use that time to play games that they might be criticized for for playing um and so those long afternoons were a time to relax and to rest so that you could be more productive during the later half of the day when it was a bit cooler so the temperatures have an important part of you know in relation to what your life uh, would be and what schedule you would live by and um that is what i've tried to incorporate into the the whole story the novel uh for example um cooking of the meals an important part of of uh, the daily routine and some of those routines i miss especially once i came to the us where um a lot of prep work happens with the kitchen and so early morning meals start uh, sorry afternoon meals start way early and the whole prep work starting from scratch with the garlic and the ginger and the onions and you know uh, sauteing them and the 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 smells that come around where you know you even you've just finished your breakfast and now you can smell the the afternoon meal being cooked um and then sometimes when you're taking this afternoon siesta the evening meal is being cooked and you can smell the smells um so those those memories i've incorporated into the story of the heat the the food the cooking and the fairly low slow um lifestyle where um you're really not depend you're not working based on a clocked schedule you're you're working your life around uh the sunrise and sunset and the seasons and so on so i try to uh, capture those elements in the book as well i really love the cover what process you go through to decide on that so i worked with she writes press and um she writes as the name kind of indicates is a press which i feel is really supportive of women writers um and one of the uh, support services they provide is uh you know providing a, a title cover and they're an award winning press particularly with the titles the the covers and um when my publisher sent me a whole series of um covers to choose from there there was a range of covers and and this cover of cane fields and the ominous clouds in the background um really spoke to me uh but i also wanted to check in with others who were potential readers or family and friends who knew what the story was about so i shared this cover with 
friends and family members. And, and what was interesting of all the covers that were shown to them, this one, you know, came back again and again as, you know, one that they felt really represented the story and the feel of the place. And, um, yeah, and I agree that this, you know, I agreed with them and, and I'm glad that we ended up choosing this one. And on your website, you say, my debut novel, Wild Boar in the Cane Field, is a celebration of the rural women of Pakistan whose indomitable spirit keeps them struggling despite all odds. That's very compelling. Can you tell us more about those women? So um, what I wanted to share was not just the life or lives of women, but also the men who struggle um, on those farms in the lives that they're trying to um, they're trying to make sure that they live their lives in a meaningful way, uh, but a lot of what, what is around them is really out of their control. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, because they're dependent on the seasons, they're dependent on the nature around them. And um, what I found is, despite all those struggles, despite all those challenges, there's always this element of tenderness. There's this element of being positive. There's an element of finding joy. And one of the scenes which I have included in the novel is these village women who are celebrating a wedding. And, um, and I had the pleasure of attending many such events where um, the musical instrument was usually a picture um, that they would beat on kind of like a drum, uh, but with a slipper. And in one hand, they would have um, maybe something to hit on the, the picture as well. So they would create this really um, resounding music uh, with the picture. And, and the rest was just clapping and singing. And um, it, there was this whole feeling of joy and, and camaraderie and connecting and laughter. Um, and some of the songs, uh, which I still remember and I've, I've referred to in, in the novel, some of the songs were so um, sensual and some of them had this really interesting, humorous element to them. Um, in one of them, which I've mentioned is, um, rancid uh, lentils have kind of ruined my appetite and so this was a song that they would sing and dance to uh, and and it just was quite amusing and and they also realized that this was something amusing and, and I remember as as young children we also joined in with this um, this energy and excitement of dance and singing. Your book description on Amazon says, Tara lives in a village that could be any village in South Asia, and she dies like many young women in the area during childbirth. Her short life is dedicated to her efforts to find happiness despite the fact that she has no hope of going to school or making any life choices in the feudal patriarchal world in which she finds herself. This was a surprise to me because I was not aware that the death during childbirth break was so high. Can you tell us more about that and the feudal patriarchal system that leaves women with no hope of going to school or making any life choices? But also, um, considering what you mentioned before about finding joy, the culture of cooking and so on, it just seems a weird juxtaposition between that and these harsh aspects that you're mentioning with the patriarchy and so on. How do you reconcile those? So here's what's interesting. Um, Thankfully, the rates of mortality, both the child and the mother, have dramatically decreased um, over the, the past years, um, over the past 20 years, actually. So there has been a lot to reduce it, but it's still not enough. There's still, the, the, one of the major concerns that uh, families have is that they are they they look for uh, female doctors or fee midwives to help with um, childbirth, and it, when that is not available, then sometimes women have to deal with the childbirth with people who are not qualified to help them. So that's usually the major problem. A lot of these places in South Asia, Pakistan included, have now worked with 
providing healthcare providers in rural areas. And, and what's unique about the book that I, the situations that I write about in this book, for many people in um, urban areas in Pakistan and other areas are not always aware of the contrast of their lives uh, in villages. Um, and so, you know, if, if you talk to people about um, this awareness, they, they might not be that aware if they haven't had the experience of living in a village or being part of a village life. Um, so one of the scenes in my book, I mentioned the, the, this midwife and she is educated uh, as far as, you know, she's got a high school level education, she's got two children, and there is a conversation with uh, the main character, Tara, and the woman, Amma um, Bhagan, who's taking care of her, about the need to wait until the, the woman is old enough to, to give birth, or make sure that they have only one or two children and not feel that they need to continue to give birth because sometimes the, the feeling is it's, this is what is written, this is a gift from, from God, and therefore um, there shouldn't be any control around childbirth. So all of these, whether they are cultural or religious um, expectations, they, they have to be considered when people are making choices. The juxtaposition of that, what you said about finding joy and the culture of cooking and the smells and the richness and everything, it just seems to clash so much with the, the harsher aspects, you know, of the patriarchy and so limited. How do you reconcile those two, the extremely rich culture with almost a form of oppression? Like, how does that reconcile within somebody? So, um... In relation to that juxtaposition of uh, patriarchy and feudalism, um, what is unique in the rural areas in Pakistan is that in many places, women and men work closely together. Uh, and that is part of the expectation because um, you know, on in a farm in on a farm it's expected that everyone participate in all of the responsibilities of what needs to happen and so it it seems contradictory sometimes that um, that juxtaposition of the cultural expectations and a patriarchy but as I mentioned earlier um, when I write this novel it's demonstrating also that the men are also, um, as much as they might be, be on a pedestal or as much as they might be able to, they, they might be given precedence, um, they in their way are struggling to make ends meet, to be able to uh, support their families. So I guess what I don't understand is if this, there's a, the spirit of finding joy as well and, you know, the enjoyment of the food and the, the cooking mm -hmm. and the culture and the togetherness, <clears throat> why do they feel the need to suppress women and not let them have educational opportunities if they are finding the joy? It just doesn't mesh with that. Well, yes, that, that is a challenge uh, as far as understanding uh, why that happens. And, I, and part of it is, I think, sometimes people tend not to question that expectation of what a male child will bring to the family as opposed to what they feel that a female child will not be able to bring. And so sometimes it's, it's a point that it comes from generational expectations that te people tend not to question as much. Um, and now more, more and more, um, there is that questioning going on. There are young women uh, who are kind of uh, trying to understand why the expectation is that uh, a family should pray for a son rather than a daughter. And um, do you feel that these women's stories relate to your own, either when you were growing up in Pakistan or when in the West? So when I think of these women and myself in relationship to them, um, what I would like to think that I share with them is a level of perseverance, an understanding of what it takes to push those boundaries, um, 
uh, unlike them, I did receive an opportunity to get educated. I did have an opportunity to work outside the home in a more structured way as a professor, uh, first as a teacher at a, a school in, in Pakistan, and then as a professor at a community college in the US. So I, I was able to get the support that I needed to be able to um, create a, a space for myself in this world. Um, so I had opportunities, a, a lot more opportunities. Can you tell us about the, the different countryside um, in Pakistan? You mentioned growing up with green fields and so on. And what would you recommend visitors to Pakistan be able to, how would they be able to get a deeper understanding of the culture? Where should they go? What should they do? So Pakistan is is home to the heart of civilization. The Indus Valley civilization is the oldest civilization or one of the oldest civilizations of humanity. And so um, there's a lot of history and historical spaces and places uh, to visit. One of my favorite places um, where I go often and where I was actually born is, uh, it's one of the largest, it's an area called Kyora, which is near the river Jhelum which is where Alexander the Great brought his um, uh, army to conquer uh, India. And um, it, it's a space where you've got this, met, this intertwining of worlds of, from Buddhist to Hindus to, to Muslims. So you've got the religious, but you also have the, all the, the different conquerors. So it's a corridor of immigrants um, and in the middle of this, um, an area where you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't consider a lot of tourists, you have a centuries old shrine, uh, a Hindu shrine, um, which is, you know, which anyone would, you know, would, should, should go visit and see. So there's a lot of, um, historical tourist places that you could go to, but, but Lahore and other places in Pakistan are also the center of literature, um, Urdu literature, Punjabi literature, and now more and more English literature as well. They, you know, many cities now have their literary festivals, which would also be a place, you know, a space where people might be interested in participating and, and knowing more about the culture and um, you know the literary interests of the people so there's a range and and then of course there's um, if you go further up north there's also uh, spaces to go visit as far as um, you know going up to uh, the mountains the Himalayas um, K2 which is the second largest mountain so there's a range I'd forgotten that K2 is in Pakistan of course you've got to go not up K2 but Yes, the, see the, the it. base camp. Just base see camp. it, yeah, base camp. <laughs> how, base how high camp. is base camp? I know Everest base camp is 18,000 feet. I don't feet. know, but, <laughs> but it would be a place, I don't know if I would ever be able to make it. I'm not that much of a, of a hiker myself. I like going for walks, but that is also Now, what is the official language in Pakistan? So, um, this is interesting. It, it's, it, the official language of Pakistan is Urdu which is a combination of, you know, um, Hindi, Arabic, Persian, and, but the language, there are many languages. Which it's a spoken. combination of Hindi, Arabic, and Persian? And Persian, and Turkish. Urdu itself is a, a, a Turkish word, and it means camp. It was the language of um, the, the army. And so it was a combination of all those languages. Um, so a hybrid script, language, and does it use the Arabic alphabet? It, it uses the, um, the Arabic alphabet, and um, the script goes from right to left. And um, it's a very ri rich language, but other languages which include Punjabi and Sindhi, and so each region has its own language. Uh, but Urdu is the national language. Now it's time for Tweet of the Week, where we do a deep dive into your tweets and select one for you to tell us more about. You recently tweeted so excited to a retweet of her glibness tweeting, very excited to be able to part purchase the forthcoming novel Wild Boar in the Cane Field by Inika Rana for the fiction collection of the San Mateo Public Library. So I know it's difficult to get into libraries. How did this come about? 
So I am very lucky to work in the system that I'm working in. It's a community college system. And for a while, I was an administrator responsible for not only the athletics department, but the learning center and the library. So I have a, and I've also taught in a, you know, a course, which is a learning community in close collaboration with the librarians. So if I could live my life again, maybe I would come back as a librarian. So I have that personal and professional connection with the libraries. Um, but the reason this tweet came about was um, I also had the luck and the pleasure of working closely with another organization called Play on Words. And what this organization does is they work closely with actors and writers and um, they choose actors to read pieces from um, works of writers. And so um, I was really lucky this last spring that Play on Words chose one of my chapters, uh, The Shrine of Sain Makiyanwala, to be read at an event at the San Jose Museum um, by another actor. And um, again, the same organization has chosen another chapter from my book, which will be read at um, Litquake in San Francisco this October. Um, and the title of that chapter is Birth Canal. And so um, the librarian who tweeted this, her brother uh, is also a writer and his piece was being uh, acted out uh, on at this event and so we met we connected at this event and that was where she learned about my book and um, and since then I have I reached out to my local libraries to connect with them I've had a great response from uh, the library in Redwood City um, San Mateo the public libraries um, Milpitas and and um, Oakland as well. So I'm reaching out to our local libraries because I feel ha being um, part of the community, I want to share these stories with our community members. Kirkus Review says about wild boar in the cane field, Rana is a vivid writer with a talent for evocative metaphors, then gives the example, tea stains are nothing compared with how my life has been marked, and goes on to say her prose is full of intimate, detailed descriptions that make the book's rural setting come to life. So we're going to finish off with you reading an excerpt from your book. Can you set the scene for us? So um, my, the excerpt is about Tara and Bhaga. Tara, my main character, and Bhaga, um, the woman who is caring for her. And they, this is their second visit to the shrine of Sain Makiyanwala, or the Keeper of the Flies. And they're both coming to pray for um, something that they both want. Um, Bhaga has not been feeling well, so she's come to pray for help. And Tara's constant prayer is for a family and a sense of belonging. So um, I will start reading. We arrived after the sun had set and the evening prayer time was almost over. I pushed our way to the shrine entrance and found a clearing for us to sit and rest. I remember that the Malvi had cautioned me last time about how women and girls were not allowed to enter the building for fear of impurities that they might bring with them. So we stood near the archway facing the grave and prayed. My prayers were slower this time. They were the same as before, a home, a family, and if I were very lucky, a loving mother, but I knew it would take a long time for all those prayers to be heard. Amma Bhaga had a lot more to ask. She started by mumbling prayers for her dead parents and then for her dead husband. The blessings on the dead would strengthen the prayers for her health. She started with a mumble, and then tears rolled down her pockmarked cheeks. I couldn't help but start crying myself. Her pleas became more frantic and louder. She wanted to see her dead mother again in her glory and paradise. She wanted all her, sin, her own sins to be washed away and all her miseries to be drowned. She wanted Bibi Safia to return the, mother, the money that her husband had given her as a down payment for a lot of land. She wanted her sons to be as faithful and true to her as her husband had been. She wanted sons for her sons so they would continue the family lineage for years to come. She wanted each son to have one wife 
or two if he chose, and for the wife or wives to be caring and loving to her grandchildren as she had been to her sons. At the climax, she prayed that she would die with her sons and grandsons around her so they could all lift her body wrapped in the white death sheet and take her to her next life so she could transcend and join her parents in paradise. I was weeping uncontrollably with her and exhausted, we sat in silence for some time. After a while, I could smell the evening meal being cooked in the same outdoor kitchens where we had left the meat we had brought during our previous visit. The aroma of the freshly baked roti comforted me in these unfamiliar surroundings. A wealthy landowner must have had a good crop that year, or maybe he had found a second wife or given birth to another son, and the supplicants at the shrine were benefiting from the offerings. I left Bhaga and returned with a stainless steel plate of steaming chicken and two rotis. I ate hungrily, but Bhaga's appetite still had not returned. So we threw the leftovers to the dogs that sat staring at us from a distance. We sat in contented silence when the drum beats began. First one, then another holy man, a fakir, stood up to dance in frenzied circles around the drums. I had not noticed them earlier that evening, but one after another, men with long, gaudily patched, tattered green shirts and unruly tangled hair began twirling to the drum beat. The tempo increased and a female fakir joined the others. Her hair, like theirs, was an uncombed mess, unwashed and matted. She inched toward the center of the dancing men, circling faster and faster, leaving the drumbeat behind, controlling the others with a dizzying force. The spinning dervish hypnotized us all. I looked away to gain some control, but Amma Bhaga chose to drown herself in the circling frenzy. Her eyes had whitened like those of the fakirs. She stood up. Her feet began to move in time to the drumbeat. Allahu, Allahu, she repeated. I wasn't sure if I should join in or stay seated. I decided to stay where I sat. The frenzy both scared and fascinated me. I'm not sure how long it lasted, the drumbeat, the chant, the feet, the dance, the heat. We were all hypnotized. The female fakir continued to lead the dancers as they now circled the drummers who dropped their heads but continued the beat in a trance. And then, one by one, the dancers collapsed in small heaps of silence. The flies that had been aroused by the vibrating sound and movement settled in mounds on the falling dancers. Wild Boar and the Canefield is available on Amazon and you can find the link in the description below as well as the link to Anika's website, anikarana.net. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure as well. And I hope the readers enjoy the story. <laughs>